All right, welcome back to Advent of Code for 2024. We've got about three minutes until the problem opens for the first day. So let's take a look at what the setup looks like this year for me and potentially you if you are also looking at my repo. There's a 2024 directory with a Rust directory inside of it. That's the one we'll be spending most of our time in for these videos. And we've got a just file and a number of commands inside of it. Just as a command runner, you can find it at casey slash just. And it's a bit like a make file, except it's a little bit nicer in certain respects. The commands we'll be using today for the most part are going to be create day, which uses cargo generate and just get input. Just get input will use the session from your advent of code login. So you will have to get that. You will have to put that into your nvrc like I'd have over here with these instructions if you are going to use this. This script it runs is a cargo script. So this is actually a Rust program in a single file. This is a really cool nightly feature. We get to specify the addition of Rust that we're using alongside the dependencies. In this case, we have clap, nom, and request. This is not a terribly complicated program, but it does use concepts from those libraries if you are unfamiliar with them. It takes the session token that you inserted, grabs your input from the appropriate day, and then writes it into a couple of files. I also have this daily template here on the right-hand side. So after running just get input for the day, or before running just get input for the day, it takes that path, gives it to cargo generate and generates a scaffolding for each day. I do this because the daily template is a little bit verbose. It could be smaller, but I like doing things like benchmarks. So I always start with a lib.rs with part one and part two in it, which contain tests and the code. Tests I usually use for the smaller inputs that we have if I need to work something out along the way. And the process is then used for the binary as well as the benchmarks, which live here. Uh, we're using Devon again for benchmarks this year. I took Criterion out this year. We used it last year. If you're interested in Criterion, you can check out last year's videos, but I decided to simplify a little bit. Uh, we're also using tracing subscriber for logging so we can put in any kinds of logs there. We'll see that as the videos go on. It's quite nice to use. Uh, we're using Miet for error handling. It could be anything. It could be anyhow, color error or Miet. They're all functioning the same for us because we're not really doing custom error types. We mostly just do some error return stuff. So that's what this context is here, et cetera. And you can see our process function from part one. So we read these input files in, these run. These are two different binaries. In Rust, you can put binaries in source bin and they will act significantly similarly to main.rs. So we'll be able to cargo run each of these parts individually. I won't be committing the input to the repo this year. So these files are get ignored and they get pulled down automatically. Other than that, this includes a couple of tools that I think are useful. You don't have to use them if you happen to be looking at this code. Glam is really nice for things like Vec2s, Vec3s, any grid kinds of things that we're doing. Iter Tools has some nice things like Cartesian product, um, some extra iterator functionality. Nom is a parser I tend to use for these problems. Sometimes it's a little bit overkill, but I do like using an actual parser. It gives a little bit more structure to my parsing code helps me fix issues if there are any. Rayon for some really easy parallelism. Tracing and tracing subscriber are again for logging for us. RS test and RS test reuse are for table-based tests. If you don't know what table-based tests are, table-based tests are basically a series of inputs and outputs that should process and match when you don't wanna rewrite the same test function over and over and over. Devon for benchmarking. Devon worked out great last year, so I'm happy to use it again this year. Uh, Miet for error handling and nom locate. We also have nom supreme in here. It's only going to be useful if you like writing that kind of code. Uh, if not, you can just get rid of this. Sometimes I use it, sometimes I don't. Nom locate is particularly useful for when we have to do grid-based parsing. So if we get a grid of characters or numbers or whatever, we can use nom locate to pull that information out and then stick that information in glam and a struct. And that's about it. Test log also helps us get the logs that we're putting together with tracing in tests if we need them. So significantly lighter this year than last year. It looks like the problem has actually opened. So let's get into it. As usual, there is a word problem here that we have to parse out. We get some input here, uh, and then we have to submit our answers down here. Now I'm not doing anything for leaderboards or I wouldn't be making this video <laughs> because explaining it probably takes more time than some people take to do it. So let's see, historian hysteria. The chief historian is always president always president, always present for the big Christmas sleigh launch, but nobody's seen him in months. Uh, last anyone heard, he was visiting locations that are historically significant to the North Pole. 
accompany some people to check the places they think he was most likely to visit. Uh, this is just explaining the star thing, right? Each day you get a star. You could do 50. I suggest you start doing just the part ones. Early on, it will be easier to do both of them. Later on, it will be harder to do both of them. Okay, so we've got a location ID and a second list. Looks like it's two lists of location IDs. So these two lists. Maybe the lists are only off by a small amount. To find out, pair up the numbers and measure how far apart they are. Pair up the smallest number in the left, left list with the smallest in the right, then second smallest, and so on. So basically, uh, I'm seeing like sort and zip these. With each pair, figure out how far apart the two numbers are. So we'll probably subtract them from each other. Add up all of those distances. So three and four would be the absolute value of three minus seven. If nine and three, then it's a six. So we don't really want this, I guess, order to matter. And then it gives us a number of tests that we could write. I think I have a pretty good idea of what this is looking like. Uh, so I'm not too worried about it. Find the total distance in the left and the right. Add up the distances which would be 11. So this can be our first test. This has to be the input that we parse in. So we'll just create day one. That runs my just command, writes out my input. If I look at day one, I should have two lists of numbers, which I do. If I look at part one, we can dump in some input here for testing purposes. And we've got a to-do up here for the processing. What is the answer for this? The answer for this is 11. So we'll drop 11 in here too. So this will fail. If we do a cargo test and I can do like a just work day one, part one, and this will show us a little bit more of what's going on. I'll make this a little bit smaller. I think it's a little hard to read that big, but here we can see all the tests failing and whatnot. So for us, if we wanted to, we could do something like 11.2 string. And because this could potentially fail in most cases, we can get rid of the to do here for the test as well. And what we see is a passing test here on the left. If we make this 15, this should fail. So we're getting this input. It's separated by a number of spaces. And then we need to basically put those into two vex, sort them, zip them together. One thing that's really important to remember when we're doing these is that the input can significantly vary from the test input that you see. So in this case, it does have three spaces between, but it is five numbers on each side, potentially more. It is not strictly speaking going to be the same that we were given, which is a single digit. So we could go for something a little bit simpler. We could do input.lines, and this gives us an iterator for each line. So that's each of the new lines. We can create two vex here, left and right. Both of them will need to be mutable. So we'll let mute left and right for each line. And actually, if we go into the standard library, here we are at standard str, which is the string module, or the str module anyway. And we can see some split functionality here. We could just go with split. Split will allow us to split something, return an iterator, which we can then iterate over. But there is also split white space, which is an iterator over the non white space substrings separated by any amount of white space. This is actually probably better for us. So we can do split white space instead. Typically in advent of code, things are ASCII. So we could split ASCII white space as well. So instead of doing something like this, we can do let mute items equals split white space. We'll just pop the next one off and push them into each vec. You'll notice that before this happened, uh, we didn't declare what was going to be in these vex, which the Rust compiler told us was, hey, like we don't know what's going to be in this vec. You have to say what's going to be in here. But once we start pushing things in, uh, we now know exactly what type that's going to be. And if I bring up the type inlays, the Rust compiler would tell us, hey, this is a vec of string slices. So for each line, a string slice in our input, we split on the white space for that line. The left goes into the left, the right goes into the right, and then we have two vex. Now we also need to sort them. There are a whole bunch of ways to sort things. In this case, just running sort should work and it takes a mutable reference or an exclusive reference. So we know it's gonna mutate our vec. So left.sort and right.sort should give us two sorted vex. If we wanna know that, we can debug left and right here and we get one, two, three, 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 four and three, 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 four, five, nine, which one, two, three, 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 four. And yep, that looks right to me. Now these aren't numbers yet, which is totally fine for us at the moment. We could do the parsing up here for the numbers. If we were going to do that, we would do it like this. So when we do our next, we can unwrap that, parse it, unwrap. This is kind of the intro level Rust. Typically, next will give us an option that wraps our value. If you don't know how to handle that yet, you can just unwrap it, you get the value. We can then parse that string slice into an i32 by specifying the type using the turbo fish and unwrap that as well because it could potentially fail. 
In our case, none of this will fail. It usually doesn't for Advent of Code, so you don't really have to worry about that unless you make a mistake. And then we get a type of VEC I32 up for left and right, which have been sorted. And if we look at our numbers, they are still sorted. Now, iterators in Rust are pretty cool. We do have access to a zip function, which will allow us to pair these up into a tuple from each VEC and then iterate over them. So this is gonna be standard iter zip. And we're just gonna replace our debug with that. So doing a standard iter zip with left and right allows us to map over the iterator that this creates. This is a tuple, so we get to destructure the left and the right items from each of the vex. We can just do left minus right dot abs to get the absolute value. Remember, we don't want the negative number if the bigger number is on the left. And to not care about that, we'll just absolute value it. And then we have this wonderful function called sum, which will allow us to just sum this up into this result. So we can replace it with our result here. And if we've done everything right, our test will pass. We can be doubly sure by debugging this out, but keep in mind that if the test passes, the output will be captured. So in this case, the result is 11, which is exactly what we expected. Best option here for us would be cargo test dash P for the package day one, part one, no capture. Make sure I didn't remove the debug and we can see result 11 here. And then if we get rid of that no capture, we again don't see that output. So if you wanna see these debugs, you do have to specify no capture. This is a passing test. So we can run this binary and get an answer. And hopefully we've done everything correct. So we got a gold star. So now you have the option to continue to part two. I think for the first couple of days, if part one feels hard at any point, just don't do part two, it's fine. I think for today we can do part two. And this time we have to figure out exactly how often each number from the left list appears in the right list then calculate a similarity score by adding up each number in the left list after multiplying it by the number of times it appears in the right list. So we probably want a unique to left list is my guess. I'm curious as to how they handle the threes here. So we'll read some of this. The first number in the left list is three. It appears in the right list three times. That's cool. So the similarity score is three on the left times three occurrences equals nine. It looks like they are double counting each of the threes. So this kind of thing is very important too. These little like nuances. Do you count future threes or not? I would have uniqued this list just from reading the original description. But again, these are just puzzles. They aren't real programming work. So in this case, same input results in a number of 31. So we can do the same thing we did earlier. Grab this, put our input in here. This needs to be 31. That is not the number 31. <laughs> We're going to copy some of this code in because it basically does the same kind of thing that we need to do. So we've got our left and our right, our input dot lines here for line. We're pushing them into each. In this case, it doesn't matter if we sort them. So we're not actually gonna sort them. And we can do an iterator on the left to map over this. I'll call this number. And what we need to do here is kind of a find or a filter or a count. So the standard iterator trait then has a whole bunch of functions for us to potentially use. We need the number of occurrences in which they match. So we do have access to count, which we can use at the end of whatever we do to count the number of results. We have filter, which we can use to filter down the list of results. So filter for anything that matches. And there are some other functions we could potentially use, but we'll leave it at that for now. So we'll write dot iter dot filter add our semicolon on that bottom line, filter for number equals R, count the number that pass, and we can do number times that count. Now we do have an issue here, so let's pop up just work day one part two, and it gives us the mismatch types. So we have an I32 and a U size, or expected an I32, and we have a U size. So no implementation for a shared reference to an I32 times a U size. Count is a U size. We actually don't care what types we're using here. So we could use U sizes here and that would make our life easier. And in this case, we have double shared reference to a U size in R and number I'm assuming is going to be a single, yeah, single shared reference. So the shared references kind of have to match up when you're doing equality. So we can iterate over all of the right items, filter for any of that, match the number that we're looking for and then count. And multiplying the number by that count gives us the number we need to add, which means we're doing a sum again. So we can get rid of that old code and do our result here. We do wanna make sure that this type that we're summing into can sum into this type. In this case, we've got U sizes. So summing into a U size makes sense. And then our test is actually passing. So let's make sure that this is doing what we thought it did. Make sure we see the test fail here. Test fails if we don't have the right response. And in this case, 
test passes if we do. So I'm pretty confident that this is doing what we want it to do. So we'll cargo run dash P for the day one package, dash dash bin for part two, and we get our response. So let's get this submission here and we got our gold star. So we've got two gold stars to start off. Feeling pretty good about that. Now these aren't really worth benchmarking. We can absolutely do that. The benchmarks are actually already set up, so it doesn't really matter. We could also do some optimization on these or try to at least. <laughs> I'm pretty happy with whatever we have here. And if I just bench all, I will get a file with that output in it. Now I tend to just get rid of the other stuff that gets put in there. So we've got fastest, slowest, median, mean, samples, and iters, and take it for what you will. I don't think it's uh, terribly important to focus on what this looks like at the moment. So for part one, we constructed two vex. We iterated over the lines of the input, split the white space out, pushed these numbers into those vex, sorted each of them, zipped them together, mapped over the tuples, so the pairs. To do our operation, left minus right, absolute value that because we need the difference. And then we can sum those together using dot sum. And since we have I32 that we're operating on here, it's easy for us to use an I32 for this sum. Different numbers can sum into different numeric types. In this case, we have an I32 because we are doing this subtraction, which could go negative. But as we see in part two, we actually use a U size for that too. So part two, very similar. We construct these two vex. We iterate over them and parse them and push them into those vex. And then instead of doing the sort, we take the left, we iterate over it and look for everything in the right-hand side that matches and count it and then multiply and sum. Now there are all different kinds of ways to approach these problems. So if you didn't do it like this, let me know how you did it. If you are doing benchmarks, feel free to drop your benchmarks in as well. I am not particularly competing in benchmarks, but I am interested in how you're doing and also if there are faster ways to do things. So let me know in the comments. That's it for today. If you're participating in Advent of Code or just wanna hang out, I'll leave a Discord link in the description. And otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow for day two. Have a great rest of your night.